Welcome to the Climate Hour. I'm your host, Bob Grove. It's hard to prioritize climate issues when we're suffering through a multi-year pandemic. It's hard to prioritize climate issues when the world's militaries are mobilizing around the invasion of Ukraine. It's hard to prioritize the reduction of fossil fuel usage when the world is being forced to expand its military to defend against Russian and possibly Chinese aggression and when existing oil supply chains are being cut off. But it's important to remember that while the pandemic can last several years and force us to learn new ways to interact, and the Ukrainian war can last for months, followed by years of sanction and political realignments. It's important to remember that humanity will be suffering the ravages of climate change for thousands of years, for millennium. Conventional war and pandemic pale in comparison to the damage and loss of life that will result from not stopping climate change. So even in the midst of the latest COVID surges and the horrific war in Ukraine, we all need to take a moment and remember the climate crisis. And there's no better time to do that than on Earth Day. Earth Day began in 1969 when a US Senator proposed the idea of holding a nationwide environmental teach-in. A year later on April 22nd, more than 20 million people took to the streets. And this first Earth Day still remains the largest single day protest in human history. That was over 50 years ago. Today, Earth Day events are celebrated in over 140 countries. In the heart of the Midwest, Kansas City's 2022 Earth Festival is typical of today's Earth events, trying to move past the pandemic, but still wary of the COVID surges throughout Europe and Asia. Earth Fest 22 is being produced as a hybrid event, simultaneously online and in-person at Unity Temple on the Plaza. This will allow those that are ready for in-person contact, contact to meet at Unity and those who prefer to remain at home to attend virtually. EF22 is Saturday, April 23rd, and is free with registration. The festival includes a climate fair, art exhibit, a tree giveaway, speaker presentations, and a film festival. We're joined today on Zoom by festival organizers, Victor Doherty, director of the Temple Buddhist Center, Stephen Melton, leader of Citizens Climate Lobby, KC, Ira Herrod with the Greater Kansas City Interfaith Council and the Environmental and Social Justice Committee, Keith Mundy, ELCA Central State Senate and Lutheran's Restoring Creation Team, Jim McGraw with the Unity Temple Green Team, Patricia Williams, President of Cinema KC, and filmmakers Stacy Rhymes and David Wayne Reed. Hi, everyone. Hi, Bob. Uh, so, Victor, let's start with you. Unity and Temple Buddhist Center. They've participated in previous Earth Festivals, but I think this is the first year you physically hosted the event. What made you decide to host this Earth Festival and why do you think it's important? So probably now more than ever, Bob, I think that people are coming out of the pandemic, out of isolation. And so this is an opportunity now for people to join, of course, still virtually, because we have so many joining from, from out of state, but to start coming together physically and connecting with each other around environmental issues, sustainability and the arts, and of course, also around spiritual and faith-based um, you know, scenarios. So people are, are longing for connection again. And uh, one of the most important Important ways they can connect is around environmental issues and climate change. I, I know you, you mentioned people coming together and I, I know within the Kansas City community there, there's yep. and within communities nationwide worldwide people are anxious to get out and, and gather again. So I, I think the, the organizers of VF22 wanted to give the local people a chance to have that hence you know hosting at unity. At the same time as you mentioned there's been a, a large virtual audience. I, I know the Earth Festivals the previous two years were strictly online because of COVID, and they drew attendance from you know across the nation, 50 states, five different countries. So there is a large virtual audience that want to attend. And I'm sure the organizers don't want to give up on that audience. So even as you bring, you know, as you come back together at Unity and are able to you know meet face to face for the first time in a long time. You know, we still have to remember those audiences there, the people that are online or may just not be in a position to drive downtown Kansas City to participate in this. 
And I know that people may even feel like they're suffering from what people might call Zoom fatigue or, you know, just tired of being on the screens, but it is still a very viable option energetically. We can still connect with each other and exchange. So I think truly it's a better way to look at it when we realize how blessed we are to have this ability, considering, you know, the, the original Earth Festival didn't even have this ability. So um, now now we do. And it's I know people may be tired of it, but but it's still around something this important i think maybe we should look at the blessing of it instead of the <laughs> the fatigue so to speak well the lovely thing about hybrid is we get the best of both i think if if one good thing came out of the pandemic it taught us new ways to interact socially with with yeah. zoom and all the other ways you know working from home which is good for the climate by the way so i mean we we could all get into a discussion of reducing travel and carbon footprints and stuff by remote working but the fact that we can gather live virtually, I mean, everybody has that technology now. That, that was kind of um, fancy stuff back at the beginning of the pandemic, but now that's normal. You know, grandma gets on yeah. line with the grandkids. Ease of use. Ease of use and accessibility and no cost. Um, so th the fact that we have people live in unity and talking to a live audience, that that is simultaneously going out as a webinar and we're taking questions not only from that in-person audience, but the people virtually online in the webinar can post their question. Those questions also go back to the panelists real time. Yeah, 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 that's, that's, that's excellent. And we're, we're blessed to be able to do that. So what's interesting is here we are talking about Earth Day at the same time we're becoming more globally connected. <laughs> you know, it's, it's we're not just little villages and townships spread out never to meet each other. Now we can connect with people all over the earth that we all want to love and celebrate so much. And I, I think that's kind of fascinating to think our, our, the audience you have there in Kansas City locals, you know, they may be receiving questions from, from Europe or South America or somebody <laughs> else that's online virtually. So, you know, we're talking about a global issue with the climate crisis. And, you know, for the first time, we're able to have a global audience. Yeah. Yeah. So tell, cool. tell us a little bit about the, the climate fair. I know that's a big element of the Earth Festival. Yeah. And what's this is really a unique um, event in that where else can you go to find so many organizations that are looking to connect with people to to develop volunteer programs, to get ideas, to get feedback and input. So the climate fair is going to be literally dozens of organizations that have a, a unique perspective or a unique uh, capability of of helping helping to reduce um, you know, climate change. And so you, it's almost like a smorgasbord. So as an individual, I can show up and I can go and I can talk to people and make connections and find out how they are, you know, what their special brand of, of moving forward with reducing climate change is. And the ones that resonate with me are the ones obviously naturally I'm going to get involved with, but it, you know, never, how else are you going to find all of this in one place? So this is this is critical because people who are sitting at home going, gosh, I really want to help, you know, and they might they might, you know, bop around on the Internet and Google this, that and the other. But none of that compares to being able to talk with a person who's who's doing it, who's involved, who's who's out there in the trenches, so to speak, um, who can share with them how this will manifest and and to, you know, really connect, which is really what it's all about so this, this opportunity for face-to-face -face interaction yes. um, good spot to again COVID I mean it remains on our mind and you know a lot can happen in the next what we're looking a few weeks until your festival um, any standards in place I assume masking and, and such what, what are your thoughts on that you know, right now, since the, all the mask mandates here in Kansas City have been lifted, we want to encourage people to have tolerance and respect for other people's wishes. So if you, you know, if people are masked and that's, that's, that's their prerogative, we're not enforcing, you know, we're not going to be checking 
you know, your blood type and shoe size and COVID cards. But of course, we do definitely want to encourage safety and respect for all beings at all times. So, you know, if, if everybody in the room is masked and, and you're not, that might be a, a, a clue to have one with you, you know, but we won't be checking cards. We want people to come and connect. And there's a, an openness to the climate fair. It's in a very large room. So, you know, you, 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 you can space pretty easily if this is important to you. And of course, masks are, are recommended, but, but they won't be um, enforced heavily. So I, I generally encourage everybody to carry a mask. I mean, even if you don't feel at risk of yourself, just as, as we say, respect and courtesy of the people exactly. around you. Um, you know, maybe your immune system's great and COVID's not going to affect you, but you don't know about the person next to you. And we could all be carrying it. We honestly don't know since a lot of us would be asymptomatic. Yeah. So I personally, I always encourage people to have a mask with them. And if you're in a crowd that people are wearing masks, or even if there's just an individual there that seems concerned, be curious and put on your mask. So I'm seeing a, a lot of diversity. I mean, I'm just kind of scanning through the list of tables. I mean, carbon footprint eating, um, Citizens Climate Lobby, Drawdown Society is going to be there, several composters, Missouri Organic, Missouri Green Party will be there. So wow. it looks like, um, well, I'm going to say this wrong, but Marais de Sins, National Wild, Wildlife Refuge. <laughs> uh, it, it looks like a very diverse, wide group. I mean, it, it's, it's going to be exciting to talk to them. And I understand there's also presentation facilities, so they're not only tabling, Yes. But every once in a while, somebody's going to jump up and run to another room and do a presentation. How's that work? So, so right next to the climate fair room is a, a little bit smaller. Basically, it's a yoga studio, <laughs> but there's a big screen TV there and, a, and a, a small sound system and a mic so that the people who are at the tabling areas can do presentations on their program or something specific to their program or, or answer questions about their program. So again, that's an opportunity to move from the face-to-face one-to-one to maybe speaking with you know a dozen people who are all interested in this you know what is drawdown what you know so they're gonna they're gonna speak and can cover a lot of people in a very short small time in that way and you say a yoga studio do we have to take off our shoes and bring that <laughs> yeah, well I, I don't know <laughs> <laughs> will there be chairs for those yes of there us? will be chairs as well as cushions <laughs> and if you want to do yoga during a presentation i don't see why not <laughs> the presenter might have something to say about Maybe. that. But, you know, it's, up to, <laughs> yes. it's up to the individual, right? <laughs> Stephen, let's jump over to you. I know you're tabling at the Climate Fair, but you're also moderating one of the big panel events. It's called Political Solutions to Climate Problems. Can you tell right. us about that? Yeah, let me uh, first introduce myself to your uh, audience. I'm Steve Melton. I'm the chapter leader, the Kansas City chapter leader for Citizens Climate Lobby, which is a national organization working for legislation and Congress. And what we're trying to do is put a price on carbon and give people carbon dividends back so that the um, fossil fuel companies would actually pay you part of their profits uh, every year. And it's a way to reward people who have lowered their carbon footprint and to get the attention of people who still aren't lowering their carbon footprint. So, and we're gonna give a presentation and we're gonna have a table there at the fair. I'm also, uh, and I, I wanna, before I forget, I wanna thank Bob from the bottom of my heart and also Unity Temple at the Plaza for doing the hard work to make this happen. Um, it's just tremendous that we can do that this, this year. And uh, your, your efforts are, are much appreciated. So Bob has asked me to moderate a panel, which is gonna be at 2 p.m. Is that right, Central? No, I, what time? I got the time wrong. What time is it gonna be? 3 p.m. Um, 3 p.m. Central Daylight. 3 p.m., 3 p.m. Central Time. And it's gonna be on political solutions to climate problems. And, you know, we, we, we've all run into this. We know that there's individual actions we have to take on our own. We know that there's things that our communities have to do. <laughs> we know that there's things that the state has to do, that national policy has to do. And guess what? International policy has to get involved too. 
right now, as we sit here, China is doing 35% of all the emitting in the world. That's more than the United States and the European Union combined. So we need to think of solutions which are going to draw China into solving this problem as well. So we've got a panel put together, and it's, um, it's kind of structured that way. We're going to look at local, we're going to look at state, we're going to look at national policy, and, uh, you know, all the way up from individual actions, you know, to the highest levels of government. And we've got uh, Winston Apple, who's a former member of the DNC and a progressive. We've got Jalen Anderson from Jackson County. He's Jackson County, Missouri legislator at the, uh, um, at the state level. We got Mike Kelly, who is the mayor of Roland Park, Kansas, and also the founder and president of Climate Action KC to talk about what we're doing on a regional basis. And then we also got Nathan Klein, who's uh, from the Green Party of Kansas City, Missouri, to talk about their agenda. And we're going to have a, a nice seminar um, discussion beginning at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time. And um, it will be simulcast. And it'll be a webinar. So people who are not there physically can participate and ask questions. And we're going to discuss all these political solutions in a discussion format. So. I think it's going to be a great, great time, very worthwhile. And Bob, thanks for uh, thanks for thinking of it, and thanks for inviting me to moderate. It sounds like uh, you're, you've got representatives from a lot of different parties. I mean, I heard the Greens, Progressive, Dems, so on and so forth. So, different, perhaps different um, climate solutions being offered. Do you think they're is a chance for a common solution? Do you, do you, you think that there can be a consensus reach on how we all work together and pull toward this? Or you think it's going to be a fight fest? Well, <laughs> we'll see. I, I, I think it's going to be a bit of both. Uh, and I think it's going to be, there's going to be a lot of agreement on some things, but there's going to be a lot of differences as well. Um, and, and we can explore those during, during, the, uh, during the discussion. I, I think we will agree on more than we disagree. And, well, and I would say that because the problem is so urgent. You know, we can't let our perfect solution be an enemy to the good solution that most people will agree on implementing. So, uh, you, you know, from what I read, uh, by 2050, it's going to be start getting bad. On the planet. It isn't like we got till 2100 to fix this. You know, we have got to fix it now because by 2050, when my grandchildren are 30 years old, they will be living with dire effects caused by climate change if we don't do something about this. So we need to do something about it. That's, that's the bottom line. And um, I, I think we can come to a great degree of consensus. Well, that'd be great. Um, so obviously the, the, these different philosoph political philosophies coming together and the opportunity for not only the in-person audience members to ask questions, but also the people who are virtually online in the webinars to post their Q&A and have those questions actually delivered to the panel members to answer live. Right. And we'll give it to the responsible panel members. And, um, you know, uh, we don't have anybody who's really from, you know, the conservative the right wing of the Republican Party, who's on the panel, those people are very hard to get to participate in a panel on climate change. Uh, some of them are climate deniers, or some of them, for political reasons, for careerist reasons in the Republican Party, are just laying low because, you know, they really can't discuss this honestly. Uh, but we could probably get some good discussion from participants, from, um, you know, who are in on the webinar who are asking questions and that we can answer their questions honestly and uh, forthrightly. Along those lines, I mean, I know on this show, on the climate hour, I, I have had Republicans um, on air and you know they're out there fighting climate change like the rest of us. I hear what you're saying about they're a little rare and harder uh -huh. to get hold of. But they are there and their point of view is important. And, you know, we hope they'll, they'll participate either online or whatever way they want. You know, it'd be, it'd be lovely to have that party represented on the panel. So maybe somebody will reach out to us between now and the festival. 
Well, so wouldn't that be great? And, and you know, it's, <laughs> it's always true of human beings that they want to be heard before they'll listen to what anybody else has to say. So, you know, everybody that's, that's wants fair. to get out their two cents worth, uh, you know, and then once they, once they get it out there, then they're more willing to listen to what other people have to say. So, you know, that we, we should always respect people's opinions, even if they're Absolutely. Different. Absolutely. So let's jump to something we can all agree with. Trees are good. Uh, Jim, I think this is the second year you've hosted a tree giveaway. And, you know, we all know that planting trees in our yard is one of the easiest ways to fight climate change. I mean, it sequesters carbon, it pulls it out of the air. What's better than that? So what kind of trees are you giving away and how do people get them? Yes, uh, the trees that are going to be given away are swamp white oak, which are a native tree, great shade tree, very resilient. And then the second type of tree are uh, red buds, which in the next couple of weeks, we're going to see the beautiful purple magenta blossoms. So uh, we're doing this in partnership with Heartland Tree Alliance, who was part of Bridging the Gap. And they've worked with us for years, providing us with saplings, approximately one to two feet in length, fully packaged directions on the trees, so they're easy to plant and easy to maintain. And uh, to your point, I think planting trees is something everyone can agree on and they will offer benefits both physically, uh, psychologically, aesthetically for decades. How people pick them up? Yeah. Right in front of Unity Temple on 47th Street between the hours of 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. People can literally walk up or drive up and volunteers will provide people with these trees. They're free, no RSVP is needed. Uh, we're gonna make it really easy and we can offer two trees per household, so to speak. And uh, we will also try to answer any questions that we can regarding like, the planting and maintenance of the trees. So how many trees are you giving away? Yes, uh, at this point, probably a maximum of 50. So it will be on a first come, first served basis. But for people who aren't able to get trees that day or if we run out, we're also going to provide some information about another tree giveaway event. Specifically, it's going to be April 29th associated with Arbor Day. And at the three major community recycling centers in the Kansas City metro area, people can also pick up seedlings there. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're attending the, the Earth Festival, you know, one of the presentations or the climate fair or whatever, you can just pick your tree up on the way in or the way out either way. If yep. you're if you're vir if you're local but virtual, you can just drive up and honk your horn and somebody will bring it to the car. Yes, indeed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So whatever level of interaction you want, the trees are available. But, you know, 50 trees, two per household, that's probably going to go pretty quick. So they do. Once, I, once that opens up at two o'clock, you know, be there. Be there. <laughs> it, it's been very popular in the past, actually. And again, we're we're so thankful to Heartland Tree Alliance to put a plug in for them since 2005 in Kansas City they've been involved with planting over 18,000 trees. So they do That's great, great. It, it, amazing. Does the, so the trees are, are packaged, I mean, some sort of container. Um, how quickly do you need to plant them? I know there's probably instructions, but just for our listeners, if they grab one, how long do they have to get it in the ground? Definitely so, probably the quicker the better but they're sure. packaged in such a way, they're called bare root saplings, such that if there would be a cold spell and you don't want to put them in the ground immediately, they would, would be good for about a half a week or so. So they do yeah. provide directions if you're not able to plant the trees immediately. That's perfect. Right, right. they only take like a minute to plant a tree. Yeah. <laughs> it's not an extensive amount of time. <laughs> it really does. At the same time, we one we shovel in one minute per tree. Right? We, we hope we're past the snowstorms by then and the ground thawed, right. right? Yeah. And, and Steve, to your point, as a layperson in the past, when I had planted trees myself, I didn't do it correctly. 
But since I've been involved with some tree planting efforts with Heartland Tree Alliance, I've learned how to do it right so the trees actually survive. So that's, a, that's another nice fringe benefit to this process. And uh, Bridging the Gap Heartland Tree Alliance offers ongoing training, free training for people to learn how to prune, sustain, maintain trees. So uh, we, we can offer information about that as well. well thank you, Jim. Sure, thank you. You're listening to the Climate Hour. I'm your host, Bob Grove. We're speaking with Victor Doherty, Stephen Melton, Ira Herrett, Jim McGraw, Patricia Williams, Stacy Rhymes, and David Wayne Reed about Kansas City's 2022 Earth Festival. Victor, I want to jump back to you. You're um, holding an art exhibit as part of the Earth Festival. It's titled What in the World? Featuring artist Jake Marshall, I believe. What can you tell us about the exhibit? Yes, oh, we're so happy to have uh, Jake uh, sharing with us. He is an amazing artist who works uh, specifically primarily in the area of watercolors. He is shown all over the United States uh, and is just really a, a, a sweet uh, individual and cares very much for the environment. Uh, I would say 99% of all of his works of art involve a, a natural aspect so it's landscapes or um, animals in a, a natural setting or uh, various flowers and birds and things like that and so if i may you you might want to um perhaps spotlight me for a moment uh, bob just so that it fills the screen for the folks um who are tuning in uh, via the, the video, but I've placed a, an example of one of the pieces here. Again, it's all watercolors, and I don't, I mean, artists, of course, who know more about this than I do would, would be there to tell you that, that watercolor is, a, is an amazing uh, medium to work with. It can be very difficult, uh, and so in the hands of a master, it can be really, truly an amazing thing to, to work with it. Let me go ahead and place uh, another one up here, uh, as you can see. Um, so Jake's, this, these are just a few. He's a prolific uh, painter and artist, as well as a practitioner. He uh, attends Temple Buddhist Center here at Unity Temple in the Plaza and uh, brings a tremendous amount of his own practice into the, the paintings and to the workings. So he's really a great guy, and we're very blessed um, to have him as a part of Earth Festival 22. For our radio listeners, I mean, we're, we're seeing an image of a koi pond with water lilies floating on it. I mean, obviously yes. watercolor. Um, very well done. I mean, I'm impressed with his work. He obviously is a very accomplished artist. So, um, and there we're seeing tiger lilies, the flowers, brilliant colors, very, very soft, um, Beautiful works. I understand that he'll have both originals and prints in the yes, exhibit, yes, and yes. he's selling pieces, I assume? Oh, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And so, so all this will be available in the gallery here at Unity Temple, which is a hallway about uh, 20 yards long and um, may, maybe 25. And has two walls, so uh, Jake will have uh, quite a few of his pieces uh, up there and available. So it, it's a nice way to, uh, of course, again, include um, the arts in this because the arts are really taking the forefront in bringing this message of climate change to the world in, in all forms, music, poetry, literature, uh, sculpture, art. Um, you know, it's in times of crisis. Is, that's what artists are for, right? <laughs> when everybody's so wrapped up in their heads over concepts, ideas, drawing lines in the sand, it's our artists who draw lines on paper and help us to see things in a completely different way. So your gallery space, I understand that that's the way people will move from the entrance to the fair down to the climate fair. So everybody will get to experience the gallery as they proceed yeah. under the climate fair. Yeah, well, that's great. Looking forward to seeing all those works live or online. Yeah, I guess yes, you can also yes. see them there. We may have some roving reporters shoot, shooting live streams of the gallery throughout the day. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping Jake will be here too to talk with people about his process. That would be neat. Well, that would be lovely. That would be wonderful. 
Um, Ira, let's talk about your event, the Greater Kansas City Interfaith Council is producing this event called Faith Communities Responding to the Climate Crisis. You know, what led um, the Interfaith Council to want to do an Earth Day event? Ira, you're so, muted. There so, you go. Sorry, got it. Sorry. Um, well, the Interfaith Council, uh, its primary goal or, or purpose in um, being is to uh, help individuals uh, better understand the diversity of faiths that we have in our community and more than just sort of tolerate uh, to actually recognize the value and, and, and seek to understand each other better. Um, but recently we've been focusing um, sharing our faith uh, journeys and what our faith motivates us to do in the community. And one of the things that we recognized is, is that in almost every faith, there is some, some deep um, uh, teaching that speaks to taking care of the earth, to being responsible for creation, for stewardship. Um, um, and so we're sort of tapping into that a uh, basic motivation that is present in so many faiths to try to help share uh, with the general public uh, that um, you know guiding message, um, and you know we like all of you um, and all of our listeners are just so aware of the impact of climate change, whether it be uh, just unusual weather and, and swings of, of temperature even more dramatic than we normally get in um, the Midwest to flooding and wildfires and storm surges and um, you know, escalated impact of uh, uh, a severe, severe weather. So uh, I think we just felt like we need to uh, inspire and share and encourage uh, all faiths, all congregations to do what they can. And to and the, our way of doing that is to uh, sort of showcase what some leaders in um, faith traditions are doing. And so we're holding this event um, and uh, gathering uh, um, uh, speakers from different faith traditions to share what they're doing, whether it's you know, recycling and uh, energy conservation to fighting um, the destruction of uh, forests and, um, um, uh, and, and, you know, and, and impacting climate change in that way, advocacy, uh, et cetera. So tell us a little bit about the panel. Who's on the panel? What face do they represent? Well, it's still a work in progress. Um, we do have, um, uh, in addition to, uh, 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 Keith Mundy, who will be speaking and is, is, is here with us uh, today, uh, we have um, uh, Dr. Ken Sonnenschein, who is one of the leaders of the Mitzvah Garden. So there's lots of different ways that people and congregations can, can uh, respond to, to um, climate change. And so what they've done is they've created a sustainable local garden, reducing the transportation uh, energy uh, consumption of uh, produce brought in from far away. They're using, uh, they're collecting water and using that to water the garden. They have solar collectors. In, in any case, they'll, they'll be kind of speaking to how their, how the, their Jewish faith tradition has guided them to um, take on this project um, and uh, do that. Um, we're hoping to have um, perhaps a Native American panelist who might speak to uh, all the work that they've done, that, that many Native peoples have done to come together to challenge the development of pipelines going through their uh, reservations and destroying the habitat and the and the uh, um, and also feeding into the uh, uh, fossil fuel uh, monster that we unfortunately are uh, addicted to, um, uh, we may have a group that that does uh, electric car fairs. Um, to showcase how electric vehicles could be a contribution to fighting climate change. Um, and oh, and I'm very hopeful that we're going to have someone from uh, the United Religions Initiative, which is an international um, uh, gathering in of um, religions from all over the world to work together to address uh, and express their faith traditions in uh, addressing the problems that face society. 
Um, and I'm, ho I'm hoping that we're going to have a, um, um, a Zoroastrian uh, uh, representative from that who does a lot of work with workshops to, to help people change their lifestyle and sort of have a more uh, a lifestyle that, ha that conserves and uh, promotes a better climate. So it sounds like a work in progress, but it sounds like it can be wonderfully diverse if everything pulls together. I'm expecting it to be. Excellent. Keith, I know you're speaking on the panel. You're with Lutherans Restoring Creation and other groups. What, what, what motivated you to become part of the panel? And what is it that you feel like this is an opportunity to share with the public? Well, thank you, Bob. Appreciate the, the invitation to be here. I've been involved with uh, Lutherans Restoring Creation uh, uh, for over a decade. And uh, if I were to go back and say, where did that, where did that passion come from? Uh, I would think of myself uh, having grown up about uh, seven miles off the ocean in uh, Southern California and my parents saying, well, we'd like to take you out to a national park. And they said, well, that sounds like fun. Where are we going to go? Well, we thought we'd go to the Everglades in Florida and then drive down to Key West and then drive back to California. That's a long trip. <laughs> that's, that's a long trip, isn't it? It was only one of several parks that I've been through as uh, my parents like to go on those kinds of uh, kinds of adventures. And it helped me develop an appreciation for, for nature and, and the importance of, of caring, especially for our national parks. And so I became involved with Lutherans Restoring Creation, which is a group that formed uh, about uh, 20 years ago, emerging from another group that started in the early 1990s. And the focus of this group is to really uh, talk about uh, awareness, education, action, and advocacy in the areas of caring for creation, uh, environmental issues, and climate solutions. Uh, this is part of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and uh, it works closely with uh, several other denominations and groups that have similar uh, purposes. Now, I am specifically working with what is called the Central State Senate, which is Kansas and Missouri. And this is about 200 uh, congregations and um, outdoor ministries, campus ministries, schools and daycares across Kansas and Missouri. And our focus here is to bring some of this, this training, this awareness, this education, the, uh, the activities and the advocacy aspects of this into the congregation and the local community area. We're doing that initially uh, this spring by doing some, some surveys uh, with congregations to find out where their interests, where their passions are, and to find how we can help provide resources and guest speakers to help them address some of the issues that are of concern to them. I'm also working on a task force uh, that focuses on the Earth Charter. Some of you might be familiar with the Earth Charter, a document that was adopted um, by, started being adopted by organizations about 20 years ago, and more recently has been endorsed by our denomination. And so we have a, a team of people here locally in Kansas and Missouri uh, that are focusing on how do we introduce the Earth Charter and its four uh, key areas of focus to congregations and support them. And that support includes uh, what we're going to be offering in this coming year are some matching grants to congregations to help uh, support and fund actions that they can take locally. So those are some of the things uh, that we have going on. We've been working on some of these things for a couple of years. We have a big event coming up in June uh, in which we're, we're looking to gather a, a number of people and do some training uh, at that point in time. And this event provides an opportunity for us to reach out and broaden our reach, both within our respective denominations, but also to some of our ecumenical and interfaith partners, because we think working together, we can do more together than we could do alone. That's great. Thanks, Keith. So we've got two major panels going on. We've got the political panel and we have the faith panel. Be interesting to see how they, if they have some common solutions or if there's a separation of church and state here that continues on IRA. Yeah, I was just, just going to say, uh, maybe in contrast to Stephen's panel, I don't think that people are going to be uh, fighting each other. Um, uh, in terms of climate change, and, and I think they'll be wanting to be to support each other and learn from each other and um, just get more people involved, so including, the, including politically. So the faith panel is at 1 p.m. and um, the political panel is at 3 p.m. 
So Patricia, let's jump over to the arts. I mean, we, we've got art fair, we've, we've got, um, you know, all these different things. And I, I think Victor spoke very eloquently about the importance of art to the climate movement society in general. Cinema KC, this is what, the third year you've been part of the annual Earth Festival? What brings <laughs> Cinema KC? I mean, why is it, why, why climate? Why, why is that an important element for Cinema KC? Well, I think that uh, when I came into the leadership, along with Jerry Rapp, we looked at an organization that was devoted to promoting local film, films and filmmakers. And um, we've kind of added the component of wanting those films and local filmmakers to take on uh, community changing subjects. So we sponsored a screening of John Brick's film, Uncommon Allies, which is about um, violence in uh, the inner city and what mothers have done about it. It's a lovely documentary that has gone on to win a lot of awards. Um, we sponsored a, a really relevant film, which is not local, called Sirens, uh, which is about um, essentially people in Eastern, musicians in Eastern Europe who are battling um, for their art and uh, feminism, essentially, and that was uh, we just uh, uh, that was just shown at the the Sundance Satellite in um, Lawrence, Kansas. That was that was our last project, and this is the third year for Heart and Soil. And I want to give Victor the the credit for coming up with that lovely, lovely name title. Victor, kudos. Um, the first year we had David Wayne Reed, who is uh, here with us again, and um, his his beautiful film. Now I'm so bad at names right now, but Eternal. Uh, David, help me. Eternal Thrive. Harvest. Thank you, Harvest. Eternal Harvest. Um, it, it dealt with something that's near and dear to my heart, which is the the tall grass prairie and natural prairies because all of this is very personal, I think probably to all of us, but to me, I came out of parents who um, were out of the depression and a mother who uh, had homesteaded and the dust bowl destroyed the prairies. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a horrible event. And then I grew up because of that with parents who were nutty about organic farming and things that people just thought were insane at the time. So David's uh, film, uh, it just, it's so beautiful and so personal because it's about, it's about his home and his family and the farm. And now he's come up with a new one. Uh, which is called Land and Flower. And I'm, I want to go back to Land and Flower and just give you a moment to introduce yourself, David, and tell us some of the things you've done. And then maybe jump to Stacy and let him introduce it, himself, and then we'll go to the actual films. And I do want to say before David does that, that what this is is less a film festival than um, a collection of films that hopefully promote discussion. And so we do have guests and the filmmakers themselves uh, will have a critic this year, uh, but we, we also will have community people who can input to how these films can resonate within the community and within environmental issues. And now David Wayne Reed, just list off all of those accomplishments because you're great. Well, thank you so much, Patricia. I'm so glad to be invited to come back to Heart and Soil. Um, as Patricia said, I was part of it in uh, three years ago with my film Eternal Harvest, which um, was filmed on my family's farm down in Lewisburg, Kansas, Miami County, um, over the course of a year. And I really wanted to use kind of red state landscape to illustrate Eastern philosophies of reincarnation. And, um, you know, my dad told me something very uh, poignant when I was a young man, uh, and he said that reincarnation was possible. Um, just look at the perennial plants or a volunteer crop of wheat and the emergence, the, the perpetual emergence of um, life. And that really struck me. And that was the basis of eternal harvest um, and focusing on agriculture and video installation and the like and dance and my grandmother's quilts. Um, this film 
uh, currently land and flower. Um, this will be the first Kansas City viewing of it, which is really exciting. Um, but it focused on one area of the farm that I did not include an internal harvest, and that was our remnant prairie. And so land and flowers specifically about the erasure of the tall grass prairie. When I tell people, tell friends that, you know, we have a landscape as biodiverse as the Amazon, upwards of the Amazon, and only 3% of it remains, people are shocked to know that it's here that we live upon this ground. And that was so surprising to me and also not at all surprising to me. Um, and so it became an opportunity for not only a call to conservation, but a bit of an emergent benediction. Um, you know, you were all talking about faith and politics and um, landscapes and, and environmental um, spaces. And what I've found is that works that are like facts and figures don't really cross the across the aisle to reach people. I found that um, connecting people, their hearts um, or their nostalgia for land and letting it speak for itself has been maybe a little bit more effective, at least from the filmmaker um, realm, because everybody understands that sense of place, the sense of identity that comes from place. Um, with Land and Flower, I don't have any humans in it. Uh, it's based off of a poem that I commissioned of Megan Kaminsky. Um, and it features music by The Wires, um, Laurel Parks and Sasha Groshong that would um, show sound currents on 91.9. Um, they are real heroes of the show and it's narrated by um, a couple of voices. I wanted the voices to serve as roots, the roots that have been uprooted by westward expansion and the plow that has destroyed much of the um, tall grass prairie. I'd like to say that it can still be saved, um, but in some ways it's a eulogy for a landscape that is mostly gone. Um, and so I hope that that lights a fire of awareness and acknowledgement of a place that's so, so beautiful. Um, that's a little bit about land and flower. I'd like to come back to Land and Flower and talk about the, the five sections and certainly the, the fact that it, it is a eulogy of sorts. It, it's quite spiritual, um, but I, I'm, I'm honestly um, working with time and I wanna get Stacy in here and then if we can come back and talk some more about it. Um, so let me introduce Stacy Rhymes. Stacy Rhymes has been a broadcast professional for a lot of years. He's a fine filmmaker. He did study with me when I was the uh, director of media arts at um, the uh, art institute, the Art Institute International of Kansas City, Missouri. And Stacy, tell us a little bit about yourself and about the Forty Fourth Street project your film? Well, growing up in the 60s in a farming rural community in Northeast Texas, I've always cared about it, uh, our environment. And let's fast forward 50 plus years later, I found myself in the inner city of Kansas City living on 44th Street. And I found out that it was one of the major dumping zones in our city. And the 44th Street project I did to raise awareness as to the plight of what's going on in the inner city. Uh, and Stacy, tell me what which uh, radio stations you're working at right now. I'm with KPRSI 103 Jams and Gospel 1590 106.1 FM, uh, 22 plus years in county. So here's one thing that interests me. Um, I was just appointed to the Gender Equity Commission of the Human Rights Commission for Kansas City, Missouri. And I'm on the UN uh, Association. And what, what is uh, major initiatives in both of those organizations are about climate change and human rights, uh, the impact of, on women, the impact on children, the impact on human rights. Talk a little bit about human rights. Black well, the the, the the pandemic is kind of the, the the pandemic really put put human rights on the back burner. 
Uh, I, before we went into the pandemic, I really wanted to bring mental illness uh, to the forefront. I wanted to bring domestic violence to the forefront. It's beginning to come back to the forefront now that we're seeing our way through this pandemic. Uh, you're talking about Zoom calls. Uh, I heard David talking uh, and the, uh, the other gentleman earlier. I was on a four and a half hour Zoom call the other day. I'm like, this is ridiculous. I like having human contact with people. And our station's closed to the public. We do voice and Zoom interviews and we're not out live like we used to. So yeah, we've got to stop and we've got to turn the clock back on what we're doing to our neighborhood, what we're doing to our cities and what we're doing to our planet. I want um, to thank everybody. There's so much going on in this fair. I feel like we could talk for another hour, but, but we are out of time today. So thank you, everyone. Kansas City's 2022 Earth Festival is Saturday, April 23rd. All events are free with registration. The festival schedule and registration can be found at climategkc.org. That's climategkc.org. This is the Climate Hour. I'm your host, Bob Grove.